Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jamie Smith. I'm Director of Social Innovation with the Cody Institute at the Center for Employment Innovation at St. Francis Xavier University. I'm very pleased to be here uh, with you all this morning, calling in from Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, of course, um, as you, you know, um, we have all been thinking deeply over the past number of weeks um, as the mass number of graves has, have been um, found throughout the country. And we do hope that you will take time to reflect on what that means to you and your communities and also the work and the actions that we can all take to do better as we work with First Nations and Indigenous people right across Turtle Island. Uh, this morning, we're very pleased to have Lori Edwards with us um, as we kick off our Future of Work and Workers webinar series for the second year, um, hosted by Yogesh Gore, who's a senior program staff at the Cody International Institute and um, also an advisor for strategic partnerships at Cody. And uh, we have Farouk Jua, who's with us, um, who also um, works very closely and in partnership with Yogesh on the Future of Work and Workers certificate, uh, which is currently open for registration. We'll be launching uh, that again this fall. Um, we had a number of folks joining us, um, I believe over 30 last year in that course. And you can find out more about that if you look um, at the Cody Institute's website and also through the Center for Employment Innovation. I believe Brian's also put a link to that um, in the chat this morning. So without further ado, and uh, with thanks to the Department of Labor and, and Advanced Education here in Nova Scotia, who's the funder of the Center for Employment Innovation, as well as the Cody Institute at St. of X, I'd like to now pass it over to Yogesh, who's going to kick us off for the day. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, thank you very much for, for your leadership and support in actually uh, doing the uh, starting the webinar series uh, last year, the kitchen table webinar series on future of work and workers, and also the course. Uh, the course actually had uh, 32 participants from uh, 15 uh, different countries. And some of the participants are actually uh, have joined us uh, today. So it's, it's, it's so great to uh, see them uh, coming back. Uh, so this is, uh, as, as Jamie said, uh, this, will, uh, this is our first webinar this year uh, in 2021. Uh, as part of a series uh, kitchen table webinar th that we started last year, we had 10 of those webinars. Uh, uh, originally we had planned only, only five, but given the, uh, the, given the participation and, and level of engagement, we ended up doing 10 on, on uh, various topics uh, ranging from, we started with looking at the impact of uh, COVID-19, but then uh, we went into uh, the major uh, uh, forces that are change, uh, shaping the future of work. We looked at the role of different stakeholders like the government, uh, private sector, uh, the role of uh, civil society, um, <coughs> social enterprises in ensuring uh, equity and diversity and inclusion uh, in, the, in the workforce of the future. And then we, we devoted a lot of time uh, looking at uh, what are the strategies for a just transition? What are the community perspectives on that? So we had around 10 of these uh, uh, conversations. And, and this, is, uh, this one uh, today is, is uh, the quick start of the same webinar series, but this is the first one uh, uh, for this year. And we are excited to, uh, to have uh, Laurie Edwards uh, join us uh, uh, today. And uh, beginning, we are gonna start local and, and we are gonna start uh, with Laurie who has spent over uh, 25 years um, uh, in Nova Scotia looking at uh, the field of uh, um, career development, the job market and, and, and skill development. So let me uh, quickly introduce uh, uh, Laurie. Uh, before I, I begin, I just want to some logistical things. We are recording this uh, webinar and, and this webinar will be available uh, to everyone uh, uh, um, at our website. And uh, you are free to send us uh, questions. Uh, just type it in the chat box and, and I'll make sure that me uh, or Farooq uh, will, will pose that question to, uh, to Laurie. So uh, welcome, Laurie. Uh, uh, <coughs> Laurie Edwards uh, is, is a nationally recognized career development specialist uh, who builds uh, services, programs, and websites to help youth and adults connect with the lives they want uh, to lead. 
she is currently at Nova Scotia Community uh, College, uh, where her work uh, focuses in career and uh, academic advising, uh, inclusion, uh, and international supports. Prior to joining NSCC, she was the manager of career services with Nova Scotia uh, Department of Education. Laurie is passionate about helping uh, the homeless find shelter uh, <clears throat> and encouraging the career development uh, community to be change makers and innovators. Uh, Laurie, I know this is a, this is a short uh, description of, uh, uh, of your career. Okay but uh, you have spent uh, over 25 years uh, um, in, and, and as a career in career development and, and counseling. So I want uh, you to, to begin with, with some, some, some highlights uh, from, from your uh, long standing uh, career here. So begin with that, just spend a couple of minutes, tell us uh, what I've missed. Yeah, some it, it's kind of funny when you reach an age where you can look back and reflect and oftentimes that's where I begin uh, career conversations with people and say it's far easier to talk about career once you're further along than when you're in those initial stages of uh, defining who you are, what you like to do, and, and uh, moving forward with, with what that path is. Um, it's interesting because I have a number of influencers and individuals who helped shape my career. And when I look back after I had that chance to do portfolio and I started to kind of weave those theme, themes together, um, I discovered that probably pretty early on, I was very interested in assisting people in being purposeful with their lives in determining their interests and their skills and helping them think about uh, what is their contribution that they want to make in this world and uh, it starts and, and the value and the importance of equity and uh, I know that uh, for me back in uh, high school I was the first co-chair of the International Day for the Elimination of Racism at our high school and had a chance to work with a committee and provide a day of events that really focused on uh, raising awareness of the different uh, uh, groups at uh, the high school that I attended and then what the future would hold for all of us as students as we moved into the labor market. So really way back then, I started to get some clues about uh, who I was and what I wanted to do and lots of volunteer work and some entrepreneurial activities. Uh, I often joke of one of my earliest uh, things that I, I did do was that I grew pumpkins and uh, sold them door to door and uh, shoveled snow and all those sorts of things. So it's kind of interesting that entrepreneurial perspective combined with um, working with people and helping them identify what, they, what their next steps were. And I think, you know, my, my work life in terms of career development began with a strong foundation, which was the Canada Employment and Immigration Commission. And I worked um, first in the employment counseling field for youth, specializing in youth. And at that time, it was very, um, if I say transactional, um, you provided aptitude tests and interest tests with individuals. They listed off two or three things that they were interested in. You went to the National Occupations Classification, then called the CCDO. You looked at the attributes of work. We looked at the attributes of the individual. You did these pencil and paper inventories. You had a match. They went to the job board. They chose a job that was a great, that they thought was a great fit or made the right money for them and, and off they went. And that was sort of really um, early stages of trying to um, get into this business and understand um, that process. So how can one possible task tell me what I should be doing for my future? Or sort of, sort of that kind of initial thinking that I had. Um, from there, um, and again, that was super transactional, that job bank, interviewing people, and then uh, moving them forward through a job search process, and may or may not have, um, I can't even remember, nowadays we would call it employment insurance, to assist them with making decisions about career and moving into the labor market. The labor market at that time was quite robust. There was a huge opening of opportunities in professional and certified occupations. Um, we were still had an active industrial sector here in Nova Scotia. So we had um, lots of, of uh, we had lots of what we would say jobs and workers to fill those jobs with many of them 
if we think about the uh, national occupations classification system, a lot of the jobs were actually what we would call level C and level D occupations. So not requiring a lot of vocational preparation, some vocational preparation. So that's sort of that early grounding of working um, in, with workers in that level and then working with that professional sector and helping them graduate from university and move into, into meaningful work. Um, from the federal government, I actually had the chance to move to the provincial government. And I think that was, um, I often will tell people that uh, I started my work life in an ocean and then I got to work in a, in a lake. So a little bit smaller, more locus of control and a more opportunity, I think, to um, start to explore some innovative um, uh, to learn from others across Canada because I was part of a pan Canadian group of um, provincial and territorial representatives. We called ourselves the Canadian Career Information Partnership. We were actually funded, like many organizations were and continue to be, through um, HRSDC, uh, the Employment Services and Social Development Department. And that allowed us to come together and learn from each other, look at best practices, look at tools and resources so that each of our provincial and territorial governments could use some of these um, things, um, both in the public school system, in youth looking for work, and, uh, and our mid-career changers. The opportunity that presented itself when I, when I worked in the province was that um, the nature of work was changing. So we were moving out of that industrial age and people would talk about the post-industrial revolution. We saw the downsizing here in Nova Scotia, of the fishery. We saw the closing of um, the Devco, the coal mines, the steel mill. We had workers in transition moving away from that industrial resource base and trying to make their way into um, occupations that required higher level of vocational training, perhaps post-secondary education and training, um, and, and skills that uh, perhaps they hadn't used up to that point in the past. And a lot of uh, career uh, people who were uh, struggling with that career change. So up to this point, many of my clients that I had been seeing were individuals who uh, might have left school in grade eight to grade 10, had great work and opportunities in some of our resource based and manufacturing sectors. And then with all of these closures, what next, right? I, um, uh, adult education was just starting to bloom at this point and an understanding of the importance, not just of our, our GED programs that were equivalency programs, but also that opportunity to, um, to look at adult education. We had the International uh, Adult Learning Survey. And at that time, it listed that Nova Scotians, 243,000 Nova Scotians did not have the essential skills with which to compete in the labor market. And here we were, in, or here I was in a career development role, working with individuals and trying to determine what our next steps were. And that's when we saw the creation of community-based learning initiatives, certainly the growth of CODI and the opportunities through CODI and Cape Breton University and UCCB about uh, grassroots groundswell of, of adult basic education, because we knew as a, for our workforce, we needed to, to step it up same time so so we've moved from that kind of transactional piece where we had workers and workers with skills and specific jobs to um a, a time where those pencil and paper tests really were not as perhaps um, or as meaningful as they had hoped so we uh i had the opportunity to work with the York Center up in Ontario, North York School Center, which had developed a, what I would call a more holistic model. So moving away from that test and tell um, type, of, type of work to more of uh, understanding the individual. What was their motivations, their desires? What was intrinsically inside them that they wanted to move forward with as opposed to some of the extrinsic things of this type of pay, this type of education and doing the match that way. And what I, I 
you know, from that time, I think uh, Marilyn Burke was the leader of that center. And I would say that she was probably my, one of my first biggest and greatest teachers. And that, yes, we used a lot of the test and, and tell tools, but she also started to introduce me to the use of narrative and the use of storytelling, being able to sit down and, and listen to that person's story and then help them highlight their skills and interests to bring that out. So as opposed to just relying on that test that says, here's my interests, here's my aptitudes, this is the type of work that I want, is starting to weave in that narrative of when the student, this, when this person was at their very best, what are their pride stories, what motivates them, um, how do they see themselves moving forward in their life, and what are some of the intricacies that make up who that person is. And I have to tell you that that was not an overnight thing. Skills were developed over time and, and kind of that whole shift away from what we would call, say, Holland's theory, the trait factor theory, and understanding the biases involved in those types of tools and moving towards a more holistic of listening to who that person is and understanding their circumstances and helping them move forward. So that, that was a period of like 12, 10, 12 years of my life understanding that better and at the same time having a dramatic workforce change in terms of what type of work was available for Nova Scotians and the importance of vocational and technical training um, in for Nova Scotians in particular but worldwide at this point and uh, and post-secondary in general that uh, there was a, a real movement afoot at that point to help people move to that next stage. I think some people in, in on our webinar today will remember the federal government had a lot of, of studies that were re being produced that said the more educational preparation you had, the less time you would spend unemployed. And this was also at a time when unemployment rates were, were growing. So we needed to even it out and have people move into post-secondary education and training, as well as our basic community learning initiatives to uh, help them prepare for, for this newer workforce where, yeah, it wasn't about doing the same job that your parents did forever and ever. It was about you scoping out your next step and your, and your preferred, and what you saw as your preferred future. So um, yeah, it, it, it's interesting because I feel the same is happening now. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute, uh, but to really right now, it, back then it was disruptive people were scared, people were confused. Um, where, if I'm 40 years old and I've just lost my job and I have a family of three, where am I gonna get the money to go back to school? How will I retrain? Where will I find that next place for me if I've always worked like my dad probably did in, in this particular industry, how, how will I find that next place? So you can sort of see why the storytelling became important. It came away from the deficits of what I don't have to the assets and the capacity that I do have in moving forward. So that kind of takes us up into the, the, to the 2000s. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful, Laurie, the way you have actually provided this historical uh, perspective. And, and, and so nicely you have brought in Cody and, and role it played. And at the very end, you talked about how you just don't talk about the deficits and, 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 and challenges, but you actually look at uh, the assets. And, and we will definitely talk about this, uh, this transition over time. But you know, we have, we have people joining from all across the world, uh, uh, Laurie. So just for everybody's understanding, um, and given that you have spent uh, uh, your professional uh, career for a long period in Nova Scotia, can you just like do some comparison uh, and tell us when you look at the rest of Canada, what are some of the unique characteristics of uh, Nova Scotia uh, job market and, and skill requirement? Uh, having not worked in a whole lot of other provinces, but I'll, I have, you know, relying on my previous partnerships. So when I talked about the Canadian Career Information Partnership and, and a, an entity called the Canada Career Consortium, it did provide us with the opportunity to bring career development specialists from across Canada and, and, and see what we had in common, and I, I have to think that we had more in common than we had differently. Although at times I was a little jealous of uh, how far, how fast um, provinces such as Ontario and British Columbia were moving. When we would go into meetings, it would be 
um, having that opportunity to, to uh, work with Manitoba and Saskatchewan who had centers of, of high, high population and some industry to rural and remote. And so Nova Scotia is that. So we have um, centers for in Sydney and, and Halifax and then a lot of rural and remote. And so that kind of balance that uh, we see in, in our career fields and you'll, you know, you hear the comment, well, don't metro size that. Remember there's rural and remote and what do, what do I do in a rural and remote area to help people engage actively in the labor market and find the work that they love when there are four or five jobs are out there. So uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a different context. I think for Nova Scotia from a, I, I think we had to move so quickly in the eighties and the nineties in moving away from manufacturing and moving uh, manufacturing in terms of um, uh, the, the production line manufacturing. I think we successfully moved into a manufacturing sector now, as you can see with the, I don't know if you can call our brewery and craft markets that way, Michelin upgraded really quickly. Um, you know, we, we have certain active sectors in manufacturing, but we also, um, we're starting to think about our work in, in, in different ways um, and helping our workforce prepare for more enterprise work or entrepreneurial work, especially kind of outside that metro, that metro area. Um, the sectors, the in, I think when I, when I think about the forestry sector and the mining sector and all of the skills, the innovation, the knowledge that individuals have from that, started to translate themselves into small businesses and um, opportunities to, uh, to, to um, explore social enterprise and, and, and those sorts of things. And I think Nova Scotia, because we had to fast track it, perhaps we were, I'm not saying more prepared, but I think we had some foundations that we can deal with this time of disruption now and during COVID than perhaps some of our other provinces and territories have. And so, uh, so I think in some ways we were kind of leading the way in how do you change a labor market perspective? How do you do the skills and upgrading? How do you move people from that, from agrarian to industrial to post, post industrial age to an information and creative age? And I think, I think we were, I think with our university sector, our community college sector, I think we've been really well poised to help our workforce. Not to say that the other provinces haven't been, but I, I think that that's one of the, the benefits that, that, that we've had. It might have looked bad at the beginning, but I think we saw the silver lining and we we're seeing the uh, opportunity for innovation and creati creativity that Nova Scotia is known for. And I think that that's, that's uh, I think we're able to build our success. The other thing is Nova Scotia is completely surrounded by water. Right? Like we have an isthmus that joins us onto the rest of Canada. And I think coastal communities have a vibrancy of their own. And uh, when we think about the ocean sector and we think about the development, we read in the paper about how our, how, um, our environment in terms of the, our, is impacted by the ocean and what are the industries and what is the work that can arise from being a, coast, a coastal province. And I think that allows for us to think about uh, Nova Scotia in, in a different way than perhaps some of our other provinces and territories that are a little more landlocked might be considering um, um, developing their workforce and their, and their business sectors going forward. Great, thank you. And it's, uh, it's good you mentioned the, the presence of the knowledge institutions, the, the universities, and, and, and because of that, things have changed. But also I think uh, a lot of that, um, um, human capital that is that is developed through this. <coughs> uh, how much uh, actually uh, remains uh, within the within the province and and finds opportunity in terms of jobs and how much uh, uh, it actually uh, goes out. That's also a, a question I always hear um, as well. Yeah, and uh, I think when we look at our population growth in the past five years, especially right now, I don't know about you, but I have more and more neighbors that from a Nova Scotia perspective are from away and we're attracting talent. We're a, a place where people want to live, learn, work and play. And I think that that out migration is now starting to slow a little bit. What, I, what is really exciting about where we are right now 
is that um, I see Nova Scotians as innovators, as generators of ideas, and as business catalysts, so that we have great ideas from creativity and research to design and implementation of great ideas. And it's the selling of those ideas worldwide, I think that will be our, our future. And I think that's you know, part of our, our contribution right now. We can work from here and contribute to bigger uh, projects and work worldwide. And uh, I, I would like for us to be known as, as, a, as a generator of great possibilities for the world uh, at the same time growing our own population here in Nova Scotia. Perfect. Uh, I want to bring in Farooq into the conversation as well. Uh... Thanks, Yogesh. Well, thank you, Laurie. That was very helpful for you to sort of paint this picture from a historical perspective as well. As we, as we sort of pivot and kind of look towards the future, you know, Yogesh and I, when we built our course on the future of work and workers last year, we were thinking of three big threads or three big themes that were influencing what, what the future would look like. Mm -hmm. The first one had to do with this, with the role of technology. And, you know, whether it's about machine learning and deep learning or, you know, the opportunities that you can use or, or develop through blockchain, or advanced robotics, uh, the Internet of Things, all of those things are playing a, a big role in shaping how we work. Um, the, the second one that I think is equally important is, you know, we're in the, in the middle of a transition, uh, perhaps the biggest transition uh, between one generation and another in our lifetime. As the baby boomers exit the workplace over the coming years, uh, they're, they're holding on. They, you know, they still seem to, all the data seems to suggest that you, you were one of them. <laughs> and a stellar example of that. Um, as the boomers begin to start exiting, um, the, they're being replaced by millennials and the Generation Z, who have a very different work ethos. They have a very different way of thinking about not just what they want to do, but the relationship between work and the rest of their lives. They're looking for more balance. They're looking for a sense of collect, uh, connection. They want to have a sense of belonging. They, the the, the uh, P of purpose, the capital P of purpose is very important in their lives. Um, they want to be passionate about their work. It's not you know, the kind of job that the boomers had, and it's certainly not the, the kind of work that people previously had. So we have people who are coming in with a very different set of values into the workplace. So we want to talk a little bit about that. And I think the third thing that's happening as well is the, the, the traditional contract between an employer and an employee no longer exists in the way that it did. Uh, companies are becoming very good at breaking down work into bite-sized pieces into tasks. And there are lots of platforms out there that are now providing an intermediation service so they can take whatever work you need to undertake and find talent anywhere in the world Yes. and make sure that the, that the work can be in tasks sent out to wherever it is. On the other side, the employees are responding by saying, well, then, you know, we don't want to be a traditional employee anymore. We're going to become you know, what everybody refers to as a gig worker. We're going to have multiple arrangements, multiple configurations, and I'm, I'm an example of one of them, where we will dock and undock relationships with various contractors or various organizations on an ongoing basis. So you're going back to almost the pre-industrial revolution model where people were doing things on a piece rate basis and you didn't have one stable relationship between an employer and an employee. Now it's one worker in a very um, messy workforce. Mm -hmm. So given those three forces, and I'll repeat them again, um, the, the first one, this, this you know, um, six pillars of technology coming into the workplace changing the way in which we work, changing the tools that we have, changing the value of experience and skills versus you know, being able to use a computer to now complement or supplement what you're able to do. Second, the change of the generation, Move the boomers leaving with their value set and a new set of workers coming into the workplace with a very different worldview. And then the third, this transition towards a gig economy. If, if I walked into your office tomorrow and said, you know, I'm, a, I'm an NSCC, I'm a student, Help me to figure out how I should think about the future. What should I do? What would your advice be? Yeah, so, um, and that's actually, it's not necessarily the students that would come into my office, it's their moms and dads. <laughs> Our students are really confident. They've made a choice to take some skills training, skills training with us. 
I think they come into us with a, a vision of where they see themselves going. I think most of the times it's moms and dads and, and media that are putting an awful lot of stress on our young people in making that one right decision, that one job that will last me my whole life. And uh, I like to change the dialogue. And so if a student came in with that perspective, I would be saying, let's not think about it being one choice or plan A or plan B. Let's look at what you, um, and as you said, what is your purpose? What is your meaning? What, what is it that you want to craft for yourself in your life moving forward? And that value is driven. So much of my work would be actually that, that storytelling, listening to, the, to their story about what was important to them from high school to first jobs, to making a decision to come to a college or to a university, what as a, you know, those motivators, and then what are their values? So I'd listen to what I would, their stories to hear um, what, what experiences have they gotten the most out of it for themselves? Um, and I would say like we, Chris Magnuson from Simon Fraser University would probably talk about the pride stories and how out of those pride stories come those best performing moments. And out of that comes your skills and your strengths. And then how do we package that? Um, and that, that values piece, I think all of my career conversations really do start around that values. That who am I? What am I interested in? What are the skills that I'm starting to develop and see? And then what are the, my values moving forward? And out of that, then we can ascertain for instance, um, a student that would come to us to take a business um, admin diploma, I uh, could have two students in front of me. One that is there to take accounting and sees it very transactionally and moving through, and I'm going to articulate this. I might go on to uh, university afterwards in our two plus two arrangement with an articulation agreement. And then I may have another student who has come and made that same decision, but their stories are so different. This person sees themselves in working in a large institution, managing finances, uh, contributing to the bottom line of a corporation, whereas this person uh, might be thinking about sustainability, the environment, and sees themselves working for a not-for-profit or a social enterprise and providing those same skills. So it, the job, the occupational titles could be exactly the same, but it's those intrinsic drivers that will take that person to that large banking institution or the financial institution, and that person perhaps to the social sector um, or the public service sector. So that's yeah. sort of, so that's why I'm always listening deeply to their stories to see what's driving them to come to, to, uh, to the college and, and how well, do we it's support them. It's a very strong sort of human centered approach to, to a lot of the very thinking much. about the career. Interesting. Yeah. And so how much, how much part, does the technology component play a role in this? When, when people yeah. are thinking about this and that there's a lot of concern and, you know, people are worried about yeah. them being displaced because of technology, how much of that, how much of that plays into the narrative when you're having a conversation? With people? I think it's huge. Um, I can just talk about my own and I often do bring forward my own career because we'll I love it when people say, oh, I've got digital skills, I'm digitally literate and all of this. And then I say, well, you know, what applications do you use? Uh, what computer system do you have? And ask those questions. And all of a sudden, I find that I, you know, I'm talking to a great TikTok user or a Snapchat user. Perhaps they're old school and using Facebook. And so they're using the more social media applications. And then if I drill down a little bit further in what experience they have uh, in managing data, in creating data sets. And then we find out, well, no, they haven't used Excel. They don't know how to do filters and pivot tables. They don't understand how to take information out of data, um, how to use all of the systems that um, something like Outlook and all of the platforms of Microsoft Office. Coming to college with this idea that I can do my whole college diploma or certificate on my smartphone not understanding that, yeah, a smartphone might get you some of it, but will not enable you to use all of the systems easily uh, in, in your learning. So I focus, no matter what age, I do talk about literacy in the digital age and how important that is. Um, 
you know, lots of courses out there now. My first code book or learning how to code, moving into um, uh, how to maximize do your self-learning and maximize the use of the applications and technologies available to us. I would never, ever have believed five years ago that I would be able to use Excel to the extent that I use it. We have a system called PeopleSoft and run queries, use a business enterprise system that uh, we use for business intelligence. I would never have guessed that five years ago. And as a, you know, as an older generation, not a digital native, uh, these are new and difficult skills, takes me a little bit longer, but I talk about that experience with, with my clients and, and with our entering students that, the number one thing that they need to do is maximize their use of the technology, learn these important skills, and then apply it because no matter what job we have going forward, the truck driver delivering the, the groceries down here to one of our grocery stores has a control as a computer control system on there. What time the delivery, what's on board, what um, who receives it? it? It's all digital now. There's, I don't, I can't think of very many jobs now that don't have a digital aspect. And if you think about that in terms of essential skills, it's yes, it's reading, it's math, but it's also the digital skills that is an essential skill for moving forward. If you don't have that, I think the labor market will leave you behind or the workforce will leave you behind. Right. Just Carrying on on that on that thread for a minute, are you concerned about any kind of job displacement? Are you concerned about you know careers that people are, for example, pursuing at NFCC, which may become redundant in five or ten years? Is is that a, is that something on the horizon for you as well? Uh, the biggest thing that I you know and the joy of working at NFCC for me is the learning how to learn skills. You know, I, when I listen to our faculty, and I, and I, and I'm, I know this is probably for most post-secondaries, but I'll just speak from my own experience. But when I listen to faculty and academic chairs, and we come together and think about our programs and the curriculum and what's contained in the objectives and the outcomes, the competencies, right? And so when you start to say, think competencies, and you think about uh, the learning how to learn skills, so that if you have the essential skills, training is just going to stick, right? Because you're going to be able to read, you'll be able to do the critical thinking, you might access your allies to help you uh, attain certain outcomes within a particular program. So I think post-secondary institutions generally, um, that ability to learn how to learn, embracing creativity, and using data within that creative mode, I think that that's going to create that um, that worker of tomorrow. And 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 I do like that's part of you know encouraging our learners to be open, enterprising, digital digital skills, thinking of themselves uh, as part of a, a bigger part of the world, and not just thinking that one job, one life. That my life. So that definition of career comes into play, and. I love it when you go to a, a cocktail party, you talk about a kitchen party. When you go to a kitchen party such as this, and I would ask you, um, tell me about yourself, the first thing out of your mouth is probably going to be the occupational you. And really, when we think about careers, it's about your education and training, if your life experience, your spirit, spirituality, it's the work experiences that all come in, family, work, learning, work and leisure, and it's all coming together. You lose the occupational you, then chances are you're going to have disruption or um, uh, if your family you and your spiritual you and your learning you is not strong, that's when you might stumble and fall. But if you are able to maintain that spiritual, family, recreational you and, um, and stay learning you, then if work changes and you lose work, then you've got the education skills and training, the learning how to learn skills, and the family support or the community support that can help you move forward. So it's disruption will occur, but do I have the skills with which I can be resilient to say, yes, that I have to change my thinking about one job, one future. And I have to think, as you said, that gig worker perspective about what are the many opportunities that someone with my skill set can have. 
Um, great case here. So um, I remember working with a client who had a Bachelor of Fine Arts, had the opportunity to do some math and, and comp sci courses at Dalhousie, then turned that and leveraged that into becoming one of the first uh, people at a major insurance company when we were moving from desk, from when we were moving from mainframes to desktop. The company hired him because of his Bachelor of Fine Arts and his ability to describe and create pictures to help senior managers embrace this notion that they would have a desktop computer and how to use it. I mean, that's a really great case in point that it's not just those technical skills, but that those creative skills and other things that, that you bring yourself to uh, those jobs that are in front of you and, and just being open, versatile, understanding happenstance, so when things don't always go as I've planned, what are the skills that I can put in place? What are my resiliency skills that I have? Who can I ask for help? What other learning do I need? What skills that I do have that I can leverage to move into other work or another sector of work? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you've kind of answered a question we were gonna ask you towards the end, but I, I just wanna emphasize some of the things that you have, have talked about, which, which I think are really, really critical in terms of the sort of future proofing or future ready you know, skills and capabilities. This, this notion of being very grounded, being centered, having you know, the other things in your life being constant, whether it's your relationships, your family, the social side of you, et cetera, mm -hmm. because that helps you to build resilience in many ways and helps you to overcome those changes and challenges that might come across, but then building the ability to learn, learning how to learn, being creative, being having critical thinking skills, logical reasoning skills. And, you know, it sounds like you also need to be very entrepreneurial. You know, you, you, you can't just rely on the, the workforce or, or, the, or the workplace to solve the problems for you. You need to be entrepreneurial and look for opportunities and kind of navigate and, you know, champion your own career in, in many ways. There is a question from James here, which kind of ties into something that, that Yogesh and I talked, uh, talked about in a course before. And this came up within the context of some of the conversation we were having with participants from Africa. You know, they, they have a huge population of, of young people for whom they're not going to be able to create enough jobs. It's just not, not gonna happen. The, the demographics are so clearly skewed towards young people going into the workforce without, without work. And so they're starting to play around with models of micro-credentialing. So moving away from the university degree towards you know, small little courses that you can take perhaps throughout your life in order for you to kind of operate in the gig economy. Jameis is asking this question regarding you know, how do post-secondary um, education institutions in Nova Scotia pivot to meet this need? Do you think they need to, uh, how, how do they need to, to, to respond to the fact that we are moving more and more towards the gig economy? And I will say, by the way, the data is very, very clear in this. I was looking at the data for what they call the American Freelancers Association. We now have more people in the gig economy than we have in traditional employment. And we're just about to go into the 51% mark where more people are now gig workers than traditional employees. So the data, I don't know for Nova Scotia, the data might be a little bit different. <clears throat> how, how should post-secondary um, institutions start responding to this level? Well, I can't speak on behalf of post-secondary all in general, but I can speak from a career development specialist on that. Um, I love micro-credentials and I would love to see our post-secondary institutions. And I, I know that uh, within NSCC, this is a conversation that was started a couple of years ago. Our senior leadership and executive are actively engaged and thinking about it. About, um, and it comes back to number one, the learning how to learn skills. Our, both of our, you know, um, post-secondary secondary institutions providing that foundational um, competencies and skills, reading, writing, critical thinking, you know, the university, the science and the um, commerce, admin business administration and the general arts programming. And at NSCC, we have specific occupational training, a solid foundation that prepares people um, for whatever their next steps are and again focusing on that learning how to learn skill so doing that reflection that portfolio so that the as the person moves out of nscc and into the workforce the employer might be uh, able to provide that upskilling or that specific um, training solution for that particular employment uh, for that particular employer 
But is there opportunities? Because we know Nova Scotia, for us in Nova Scotia, majority of our businesses are small and medium enterprises. They don't have those big HR departments. They don't have those big training departments. So I think with this notion that you've just said about the micro-credential, I think that it's about partnership and stakeholders coming together and being able to uh, create smaller programs. So I've got my diploma, I've got my degree, or I've got my certificate. Now I'm looking for either an employer to help me get the specific skills for that particular workplace, or I'm looking for some generic skills that will help me move forward with my career. And that speaks to your gig employment because lots of small and medium enterprises can't afford the worker for life, one job, one life. They, they need to bring in a variety of talent because they are also looking at what the disruptions are and what the opportunities are for their own growth in the future. So they're going to be investing in their workforce in different ways. A great opportunity is investment through their micro-credential. Um, I had often, like a long time ago, and I, you know, this is 10 years ago when uh, I started to imagine our career and gear tool that's on the NSCC website that myself and Clarence DeShiffert authored. Um, that actually had a system in place where we could develop micro-credentials for individuals looking for work. So I understand and know my skills and how they apply to the labor market, a labor market micro-credential, using understanding and using labor market information to occupational information and resume writing and interview skills as all micro-credentials so that I could have that on my LinkedIn account. So even from my work, you can see the micro-credentials piece to our diploma certificates and, and degree programs could also have additional micro-credentials that would, an individual would add that would help increase their versatility in the labor market and be able to move from, from gig job to gig job. I have to say, the gig economy is super exciting and really interesting, but as, a, as, as an old, socialist, uh, liberal, <laughs> anyway, I, I can, you know, I'm concerned and I think for our, our children and the future. So here I have had the benefit of working federal, provincial, and now college. I've um, bounced between the federal, provincial government, back to the feds, and then on to the college again. And uh, I've been able to have a pension plan. I've been able to have stability. I've had employers invest in me. And I think about the workforce of tomorrow in that gig economy. And I think about the young people that I'm seeing that are values driven, that are about capacity building, about giving, giving to the world. And yet we're asking them to invest in themselves and to hold on to peace so that they know how to have their own registered retirement income, right? That they have their tax-free savings accounts, that they're planning for that future. So the same time that I talked about digital literacy, I also want to be talking about financial literacy. What are you doing today to plan for that um, gig economy of the future that you may find yourself engaged in? And I, you know, it, it is an ongoing concern of what that, that future work is going to, to look like for them. Um, and, and I think it's not just for them. I mean, you know, it's, it's for a lot of people who are employees with, with, with traditional companies, you know, a defined benefit or pension plan no longer exists. You know, exactly. those things are very, very rare. And in many cases, you may have a pension, but the company may go bust. <clears throat> so we're, we're moving into a situation where you can't rely on those traditional instruments to, to provide you with that financial security. Right. Are you able to, in your work, weave in some financial literacy work as well? I think that's um, probably one of the biggest um, um, parts of our work in student services. I, and I, I can speak from Nova Scotia Community College, but I'm gonna guess that post-secondaries across, we have a number of banks and other partners who have, have offered up financial literacy programs. We speak with our incoming students about the importance of financial literacy, planning for their college career, um, what they need to have in place because Yes, it's going to cost me this amount for tuition to come to a post-secondary, but I also need to be housed. I also need transportation. I also need associated um, costs. And, you know, the other generations probably didn't have to think about that as much. We could go without a budget, 
for a longer periods of time. But right now, I think with money being tight, with that sort of unknown future, I think people uh, that need for financial literacy about where I am now, what's living within my means and my budget, and then planning successfully for my future is, is, is absolutely key. But at the same, you know, at the same time that we talk about this and the importance of these skills, um, I and you hear about the reporting of how mental health is a huge concern for parents and for our young people that are moving through the system. And I, I think back, there's a couple of things. As a young person trying to choose about my future and the messages I get one job, one future, and not a multitude of, of possibilities for myself. If I'm trying to do one job, one future, one plan and have plan A and plan B, that's scary, especially in today's economy. So as a career development specialist, I need to help shape that dialogue and that conversation. I need to talk about chaos theory and happenstance about being resilient and bringing these skills around learning how to learn so that they can move forward. The other thing is back when I, you know, I used to laugh. I think the CCDO had 780 occupations that it listed. And now the national occupation code system, I think has 885 coded occupations. Well, and you think, you look around, you walk down Main Street, you walk through a mall, you walk into an industrial park, you read the newspaper and the plethora of jobs out there and I'm 19 years of age and mom and dad are telling me to make a choice. How do I make that choice? Like, and I've got the stress of coming out of a pandemic. Where, where will I find, where do I find meaning? How do I make that right decision? Where is that one job for me? So no wonder we see some anxiety rising and anxiety that may move into uh, the career development specialist, the career practitioner, uh, understanding what are the mental health needs? What does wellness look like for today's um, student and today's worker? And I think we'll see many of us that are in this sector are really honing our skills in supporting that whole person, helping them understand, is it really work-life balance or is it work-life blend? And what are the skills that I, as a career development specialist, can encourage you to um, bring in to your planning so that you can move forward with um, a sense of wellness and balance and an understanding of it's just not the occupational me. There are other aspects of me that will buoy me and carry me forward in, in the, as I move forward. Uh, it's about hope. I think career development people, yay, are out there about giving hope, right? Because we take what is good. We take the assets. We build we work on the capacity of the person to learn. We help them with their uh, identification of their skills, their interests in finding their purpose. And within finding that purpose, that gives people hope mm -hmm. and that there is a preferred future for me. And it might not be like this and those little steps, but it could be like circles and ups and downs. And then how, what are my skills that can help me navigate those ups and downs. So I, I'm, you know, career development is a relatively young sector. Like at the turn of the century, turn of last century, uh, the 1900s was really when this field came to be. And now when you think about what we have to offer as career development specialists and how career, when you talk to top executives at many corporations, they understand and know how to lead a workforce in terms of good career development, or like I would hope that they know how to do that. And uh, I, I, I'm so proud of our sector for, for the work that we do uh, in giving hope in helping people find meaning in their lives and purpose and to um, building those resiliency skills that they, they obviously need to navigate some, some turbulent waters. In the, in, I, and it's always gonna be turbulent. I don't think this time is ever gonna change. I think we are always, what used to take 10 years to happen now takes five minutes. Yeah, fair enough. Well, thank you. That's, that's, that's really helpful to get that, that sort of perspective. And I like the, the, the swirls and the loops and, and the curves rather than the two by two matrix, uh, because I think that's kind of the world that we're going into more and more. Mm -hmm. There is this really interesting question on immigration. I wanna see if I can just tuck that in very quickly. And that came in from, uh, from Billy. <clears throat> you know, both Yogesh and I are first generation immigrants to Canada. 
Uh, we, you know, we're also in in a in a in a moment in history where the federal government is making fairly big decisions about increasing the number of immigrants that will be coming into the country. I think we're, you know, I, I can't remember the exact number. It might have been two hundred or three hundred thousand per year. The number is definitely higher than we've ever had before. Uh, I was quickly reading the Globe and Mail this morning, and there was an article saying we're actually going to be uh, unable to meet those numbers uh, at least until 2023. They're expecting lower numbers to come in. How do you think the workplace is changing to to respond to the new immigrants coming in? And over the next 10 years, as we have more and more of them coming in, um, do you think that there is a uh, an understanding of you know the 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 new cultures that are coming into Canada, the having more tolerance in the workplace, and I'm paraphrasing Billy's question quite poorly, but you know that's the, that's the essence of what he's asking. And of course, he does say that you know immigration is really important, and he says it's awesome, and we need more of it. What's you, what's your perspective on how the employer and the workplace is changing to respond to more immigration coming in? Oh, oh. Nova Scotia will not survive without our immigrant population. We are not producing enough children to help us um, not just build a workforce, to have a vibrant um, cultural sector, to have a vibrant spiritual sector, to have um, an agricultural sector. I mean, think of our foreign worker program that uh, in uh, at the Annapolis Valley and other places in Nova Scotia that uh, we, we need foreign workers to come to Nova Scotia. In terms of employer preparation, um, I, so part of my work at NSCC is uh, managing our career and employment um, uh, programming. And this year, more than any other, I have been delighted to see how many of the employers have specific diversity and equity initiatives and inclusion initiatives and working with like organizations such as the Black Business Initiative, ISANS, um, <clears throat> Um, team work bridge and those types of organizations were the really helping employers understand equity, understanding inclusion, encouraging employers and their workers. It's not just the employer, the, the, the top dog, so to speak. It's the whole workforce being inviting and inclusive and creating a place where um, all workers feel welcome and that their culture can be celebrated and that um, there's, and I don't use the word tolerance, that, you know, that suggests that there's something wrong. It's more, it's inclusion and that we are together with the diversity of thinking and our diversity of ways of doing, I think will make a stronger workforce. And I am seeing where employers are now recognizing that. And uh, I think that that's a great opportunity for us to grow. Um, and, you know, we haven't done that great of a job of working with our Indigenous people or our African Canadians here in Nova Scotia. And I think that we need to have um, initiatives that level that playing field so that we can bring all of those who wish to work into the workforce in a positive way and be able to hear and see and feel. Um, we don't actually have to be that person, but we have to be able to listen to their story and understand how their story can actually influence us and help our workplace become better and actually be able to grow. You know, you get monolithic thinking and one, one way of doing, then you're never going to be able to change. It'll always just be flat with everybody contributing in the same way. Excitement happens when you have a worldview come into a workplace and new ideas and fresh ideas and that cultural background. That's just, it just, it's so exciting. Uh, Laurie, uh, I think we are almost at, at time, but uh, I, we cannot let you go without answering uh, one question from Alyssa, who was the connector between you and I and, and Farooq. So she is, she is working full time uh, with us now. Uh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. And, and she's there. So she has typed up a question and let me ask that question. Very, very important question, I think. And, and she's sharing her personal uh, sort of experience here. So she is asking <clears throat> the uh, the stress of, of deciding a career actually begins um, and, and what you will be doing in the future begins uh, when you are in high school. And at high school, you, you don't have a lot of support system uh, available for you to make that choice, what would be good for you uh, in, in, in future. 
So what what do you think? Uh, she's asking. So what needs to be done to support that uh, those young minds when they are actually making these big decisions? So any any answer, any perspective on that? How do you? <laughs> yeah. The, so the, the, yeah. I, you know what? Um, I think it even begins earlier. I think young women who are introduced to skill trades and technology occupations at an earlier age before kind of some of that bias comes into play, probably have a greater chance of moving into skilled trade occupations and technical uh, math and STEM occupations if they're introduced and supported early. So that's sort of one group and our indigenous students, African Canadian students, if we get at that grade seven, eight and nine level to start to, to build those skills, again, it's not about an occupation. It's about building those well-rounded skills and having those opportunities as, you know, in the junior high. And, you know, you can do everyday career development back in grade primary, right? About learning about what somebody does, what they value, what their assets are, and you're already starting, you're, as a little kid, you're forming pictures of, oh, I'd like to do that, or no, I wouldn't like to do that. Introduction of, um, it's interesting because TV shows will also, if there's a popular TV show with a popular occupation, all of a sudden we'll see a great influx of people who want to be legal assistants or dental assistants or whatever, depending on the TV show, because we don't know a whole lot about the world of work. So I think in our, um, in our programming in the public school system, I think that there needs to be more uh, opportunities for young people to explore who they are what their skills are from a competency level perspective. Again, focusing on the learning how to learn skills and then how to leverage those into to making decisions in the future. Huge role as well for parents, like we and, and uh, influencers and uh, guardians. We can't just leave it all to the public school system. Good news around some of the things that I'm hearing from the Department of Education, my colleagues there, there is that they are moving towards what we would call a comprehensive career guidance. So it's not just the guidance counselor that's responsible for that, helping that young person plan for their future. It's comprehensive is that the teachers now have an understanding of career development. Um, the, le the leadership of a particular school would be contributing to that. So it's not, not just the guidance counselor's role. Uh, I love to work with parents on this and uh, encourage parents to, you know, the, the, uh, that opportunity to explore, to explore occupations in the world of work with their kids. I, you know, I could challenge everybody on this call to give me a list of, of uh, 10 occupations. I bet you they'd get to six and then they would run out of occupations, right? Just because we just don't know the world of work enough. So uh, I, I, think, I think we're changing the way that we teach um, young people about education and training and the earlier, the better but also reminding people that it's not just one job, one you, that you have so many facets to yourself. And it's how do you talk to people about it? How do you read about it? And how do you try things on? That experiential education is just, it, it's a key to success. Yes. And, and I have a 12 year old who's in grade seven, so maybe I'll be talking to you more. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, just one more, and then I think then we will address uh, all the questions. Okay, so this one question they are asking: If what if somebody is not able to graduate uh, from high school, or just um, uh, graduated from high school and hasn't had an opportunity to go to a community college or or um, uh, higher education? What are the options in future? Right. So again, coming back to where that person is in terms of do they have the learning how to learn skills? So do we need to take a, a step and looking at some basic education? Do they have the reading and math skills, you know, grade eight, grade nine level, if that's there, then um, I always encourage because it's as, we, as studies have shown us is a high school diploma actually is that, that, that open door to your future. So somebody who hasn't completed high school, the public school system has uh, their flex system. So you can, up until age 21, go back and take your credits to complete it. We have the GED program, which is a, an equivalency program available to people to acquire their high school, with which they can then leverage to go on to, to community college. But we also have um, a, the Nova Scotia Apprenticeship Agency. There are, I believe, over 85 skilled trades in Nova Scotia that you can... Um, 
uh, become uh, an apprentice and start your work life off with an employer in an apprentice apprenticeable trade. At some point, you'll come back to NSCC or a post-secondary institution for your, your block training or your certification training as you move through the steps. But that, that, that model of um, starting with the apprentice in an apprenticeable trade first is a, is a, a great way to get re-engaged with learning and engaged in learning in something that you're super interested in, right? So if you've chosen to become a mechanic, you get the job with the mechanic, and then you're you're coming back to do your refinement for your other your your other pieces to become certified. You're there because you're motivated and you enjoy it. I, I just finished working with a young woman who is in her late 30s. And uh, she took a particular type of program at college. And it, she, she, it was her leisure interest, but, but she thought she was going to be able to leverage into her lifelong work. And as she moved through her program, she realized this was more leisure interest. So at age 36, she's made a career change and she's uh, now in the Carpenters Union and she is doing her carpentry training uh, through the apprenticeship agency as, as a 36 year old and absolutely loves it. I heard it in her story. What did you do this weekend? And it was amazing that, uh, you know, well, I built this plant pot and I did this and then I had a chance and, and it was like, wow, everything that you're doing is hands-on, it's working with wood. Um, you showed me pictures of these great things that you created. And I said, have you ever thought about carpentry? And it was just like a light coming on for her that at age 36, she never even imagined that this could be a feature for her. She's now eight months into it, is working on a social enterprise uh, project up in the valley and absolutely loving it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. I, I cannot thank, thank you enough. Somebody, I think in the chat wrote that, that you rock and I think you really rock. And, and, and this is not the only conversation. I think we'll have more conversations with you, uh, particularly some of the areas that you talked about around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And also another area that you mentioned around uh, what are the safety nets as we mo uh, move more into the gig economy and, and people doing small jobs, what is about their, their, their safety and, 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 and job security and everything. So definitely we'll, we would love to uh, have you back. Thank you so much uh, for your for your insights. I mean, uh, just listening to you uh, last one hour, like major takeaways is like one thing that you said around learning how to learn, and 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 the the idea of lifelong learning. I think uh, ILO last year in their uh, and centennial declaration, uh, one of the things that they emphasize heavily on is the idea of lifelong learning. So you have to become a learner. Uh, then only you will succeed in the future. And also, I think uh, you uh, telling us that we need to expand the essential skills and include uh, digital skills and financial skills as as important uh, skills to have in our uh, toolkit to be more resilient in the in the future. Thank you so much, Laurie. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, very uh, much. Uh, and everybody else, um, uh, Brian has been uh, sending links uh, for our Future of Work and Workers course. Uh, the course will start. Uh, in September, on September 27th, uh, the applications are now open uh, and uh, uh, there are scholarships available both for local and global uh, participants. So please, uh, please apply. Uh, in that course, I think uh, it, it happens uh, a lot of things that Farooq talked about different uh, trends that are affecting future of work, but a lot of learning happens through interactions like, like uh, the one we had with Laurie. So please do sign up. Uh, thank you very much and uh, hope to see you soon. Well,